Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anya. I'm one of the co-directors of the Psychedelic Society. And today, uh, this evening, uh, or day, if you are in States, uh, we have a special event that I was waiting for for a while. And I just, while we wait for people to gather, I'm just going to quickly take you through uh, the journey, how we got here today. So 2018, Compass Pathways files a patent application for a formulation of uh, synthetic psilocybin. They fail a few times, but they try again. Carrie Turnbull tries to oppose them. Uh, finally, in 2019, they get the patent approved, uh, but they don't just rest there. They actually decide to file another patent application uh, that would basically patent uh, aspects of psilocybin assisted therapy and such basic things like using soft furniture or good sound quality, good quality sound system or holding hands between a therapist and the patient, right? So what happens next is that Graham Pachenik, the patent and IP lawyer, starts tweeting about this and then Shayla Love from Vice writes this long article about it and then David Bronner calls out Compass um, on their interference with Oregon's psilocybin therapy program and for trying to monopolize the space and then in the end Alexander Boehner jumps in and he writes this article for Chakruna which is called who is in charge of psilocybin so we have all those people here tonight with me and I'm really happy that that they're here but then I thought Something's missing. We need a really good moderator. So I invited my very good friend, uh, wonderful badass woman in psychedelics, uh, founder of Chakruna, Bia Labate. And I'll ask Bia to come on screen first. Bia, join us when you can. Hello, my dear. Hello, Anya. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for being with us. And without further ado, uh, I think let's just, oh, sorry, actually, let's just quickly go through housekeeping rules before I invite the guests. So Bia will be first um, running a little panel discussion for an hour and a half, then we'll have half an hour Q&As. There's Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. Please do not put your uh, questions in the chat because we cannot answer those. Make sure you pop them in the Q&A section. Make sure you upvote questions you like because that gives us an idea of what questions you want answered. Bia will do selection of them, but she will definitely look at your voting system. Uh, and I suppose just to add is that the recording will be sent to everyone within uh, seven days after this event. And I think that's it. Uh, without further ado, I can ask my guests to join us. So David Bronner, can I ask you to join us? Hello, David. Shayla, Shayla Love, Graham Pachenik, and Alexandre Boehner. Welcome, everyone. And well, I'm going to tune in. Bye. Mm -hmm. All right, friends, uh, so warm greetings from Bay Area, Ohlone territory. My name, as said, was Bia Labachi, and I go by her and she. And I just want to uh, give a bit of a shout out to the UK Psychedelic Society. I believe they are the most organized psychedelic society of the world. Uh, we want to be like them when we grow up in Chakruna. Uh, they kind of own a, a, a place and have a solid membership system and a large following. They're really rooted on the ground and with on the ground and with community. And I think they do wonderful work and also are a great influence on the psychedelic scene in the United States because the U.S. is frequently very American centric, and it's fresh to see some Polish, UK, European influences on our community. And uh, we're very much uh, in awe and admiration for their efforts. And I just want to encourage everybody to join their membership and their newsletter. And with this, without uh, further ado, I want to um, start our conversation here today. I uh, want to just pass the word to each one of you to tell us a little bit who you are, what you do, and why do you care for this topic or what brought you here. But keep it on the um, short end. 
So I'll start by David, who is beside me on, on the camera. Hi, David. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you, Bia. Thank you, Anya. Um, yeah, I'm uh, David Bronner, Cosmic Engagement Officer of Dr. Bronner's. Um, we're a, uh, basically a philanthropic engine. Uh, we cap our salaries at five times our lowest paid position and dedicate all profits we don't need for the company to the causes we believe in in integrating psychedelic medicine uh, as fast and responsibly as possible is, is, a, is a key agenda item for us. Um, I'm on the board of MAPS. We made a, a large donation to them and in their project to move MDMA through FDA approval process. But that's really a tactic to destigmatize the culture uh, to the point that we can integrate medicines uh, you know, via religious sacred circles and, and otherwise. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, and so what brings me here is obviously the kind of for-profit ecosystem that's taking the uh, uh, you know, regulatory approval process way too seriously and uh, starting to interfere with the larger agenda of integration of medicine. Thank you, David. Shayla, you have played a really pivot, pivotal, or sorry, a pivotal, I don't know, pioneering role in all this discussion with your articles. Can you share a bit who are you and what do you do? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, a, I'm Shayla Love, I'm a senior staff writer at Vice. Um, one of the main topics I cover is mental health. And so it's a given that in the past three or four years, I've been writing about psychedelics a lot. Um, it's one of the most exciting, promising options that folks have for treatment that you know has just eluded them for a long time. Um, and so in writing about the research, I started to have concerns about access because one of the biggest things you know when you write about mental health is that people really want help and they can't get it and they can't get insurance coverage and it costs so much and it's really only available to privileged people. Um, and so when I started to hear about patents, it just was this light bulb of like, um, wouldn't this suck if psychedelics finally get approved for these communities? And we just see the same thing all over again, which is that it's very expensive. Insurance only covers the drug, but not the therapy, things like that. And so that's that's sort of my focus is from the mental health perspective and, and advocating for those people. Thank you. And we're also posted her articles in, in, in the chat and on the announcement of the conference, really solid pieces. I recommend everybody reading. And with that, I also want to pass the word to Graham and announce that also he has written a nice article. Uh, it's going to come up in the next MAPS bulletin, so it's not available yet, but keep on tune for that. It should be released sometime soon. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Sure, and thank you so much for having me. And thanks for that nice introduction and that plug, plug for the article. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this conversation um, so, of course, I'm a patent lawyer. Uh, my interest in psychedelics started back when I was in college, and I chose my science majors, actually, because of my first psychedelic experiences. Um, what led me to law school was an interest in cognitive liberty and thinking about the legalization of psychedelics, although the realities of law school loans led me to choose patent law. Um, and I kind of diverged away and kept psychedelics on my personal side. Um, but in law school, I wrote my law school thesis actually on the effect of patents on pharmaceutical prices. So I never thought they would sort of come back together in this way. Um, but I spent my first decade working for big law firms, primarily litigating patents against sort of notorious patent monopolists like Monsanto, Microsoft, Apple, Amgen. Um, and I started back in 2016, the patent law firm that I'm at now, Calix Law, really with the premise of working with cannabis companies to file patents to hopefully protect cannabis from the incursion of a big monopolist like Monsanto. Um, my sort of, the way the intersection of psychedelics and patents came to me was actually really because of that 2018 article about Compass that Anya mentioned by Olivia Goldhill. I was actually just coincidentally volunteering at a MAPS info table about a week after it came out and of course, uh, talking to people about the fact that I was a patent lawyer went into a lot of conversations about it, trying to understand kind of what it meant for the space. And because of that started the patent tracker for psilocybin patents that's now on psilocybin alpha. So back since that article in 2018, I've sort of just been following peripherally this um, without realizing, you know, within the last six months to a year, there'd be all this activity about patents and this would become such a big part of the conversation. But I, I you know I really have Shayla to thank for 
being brought into it um, for her, you know, bringing visibility to the, you know, the tweets and the work that, that I've done. And it's such an honor for me to be here with everybody that I've really looked up to your voices for inspiration. Um, so thank you so much for uh, the privilege of being, uh, for me being here today with all of you. Awesome. And last but not least, uh, Ali from Rebel Wisdom, Alexander Biner. Hey, Bia, thank you. Really good to be here. Um, yeah, so um, I'm co-founder of Rebel Wisdom. We're a media platform um, and we really try to um, kind of feel into the edge of the cultural conversation and try and really make sense of what's going on. So um, that is, I've, I've been lucky enough through that process to speak to people far smarter than me who know a lot about systems theory, who know a lot about game theory um, in lots of different fields. And um, that is a, a big part of why I became increasingly interested in psychedelic capitalism. Um, I have quite a long background in, in psychedelics. Um, I think from about 2005, I've been involved in some way in, don't really know whether to call it like psychedelic activism, but I suppose that that's perhaps the right um, word um, and, and certainly psychedelic culture. So I'm also one of the co-directors of Breaking Convention. So we're Europe's largest conference on psychedelic medicine and culture and um, have really been yeah, deeply, um, I, I don't know who I would be without psychedelic medicines because my whole adult life has really been defined by them in some way. And so I've really, over the last year in particular, been reflecting on what's been happening in the space and also listening to a lot of uh, clinicians and researchers and activists and, and really just trying to make sense of all the different dynamics that are at play and just how, how quickly They've also come about. It's been, um, I think a lot of people comment on just how quickly we've gone from underground to suddenly mainstream and from no money in the space to a lot of money in the space. And so I've really been trying to make sense of that. So I put out a film about five months ago called The Rise of Psychedelic Capitalism. So interviewing lots of different experts in the field to, to try and get a sense of, of what's going on. Um, and then I've also put out some films with Jamie Wheel discussing this and most, most recently, as Anya mentioned, um, put out an article that Bia very kindly published in Chakruna, uh, looking at, um, yeah, issues of ownership and also I think more than just ownership, the attempt to control the narrative around psychedelics. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in that. And the idea of narrative warfare is something we've looked at a lot on Rebel Wisdom and I think is a, a very important piece. In, in fact, it's been fascinating to watch a lot of these sort of meta ideas that, that we've been covering and, and um, exploring kind of play out in real time in the psychedelic space. So um, I'm really interested in, in how those tools and ways of seeing can help us navigate this fairly crazy time we're living through uh, in this community. So, yeah. Wow, such a panel of uh, uh, strong and awesome, solid thinkers and activists and trailblazers and movers and shakers. Uh, really exciting to, to, to have you all here. And also, as everybody said, what's kind of really exciting about all of this is that we're eyewitnesses to something that is very recent and we are kind of co-creating that history and seeing it unfold by our own eyes because it's not like we have too many references. It's all new. Uh, there's not a lot of examples or alternatives. We're all seeing this unfold and it's moving so fast, really fast. I think everybody has this feeling of, of vertigo and the minute you start to understand more things happen and it's just hard to keep up and to, to, to know how to make sense. So I think this, this panel is a, is a great addition in this and we're together co-creating this attempt to understand things uh, and to create conversations that are healthy because sometimes we can you know, attack people or hate people, but that's not necessarily heal helpful. And this panel wants to try to create these bridges and, and dialogues. Um, perhaps we should start by asking the lawyer, <laughs> uh, that is the guy that maybe really knows that, that kind of shit, uh, a little bit about can you give us a, a, a history on 
why why patents exist and why are they important or uh, what are the kinds of controversies that are specific to this field or just come together with the idea of patents, some more generic background to patents. Sure, so I can start from the real basics. A patent is in its essence, a right to exclude. It's basically the government provides kind of like the equivalent of a no trespassing sign that you can put around your invention for a limited period of time. Um, and the patent itself has claims and the claims define the boundaries of that property right. And obtaining a patent is a negotiation between the patent applicant and the patent examiner. It often takes many years. Um, and when we look at patents, like some of the ones that have been written about by Shayla or um, other ones that Compass already has granted, um, we have the claims that are in some of the applications that are still pending. That's basically just what the applicant wants to have granted. And then we have the ones that are in the granted patent itself, which we know are now defining the boundaries of that particular right to exclude. Um, the reason we have patents is basically for purposes of incentivizing innovation. So at its essence, it's really seen as a, a balance between the public on the one hand and inventors. So it's to encourage inventors taking risk and putting out money, basically exploring some abstract idea space that otherwise wouldn't go explored, bringing back from that space something new and something not obvious, um, and then teaching the public how to make and use that. And then in exchange, getting a temporary right to exclude others for a period of limited time and for a limited uh, boundaries that just cover the substance of what it was that was brought back and given to the public. So that sort of those two components of the bargain are um, kind of what to look at for the policy perspective. And it's been asserted that the debates around patents are non-existent in the rest of healthcare. Um, that is really couldn't be any more untrue. I mean, I can tell you from lived experience because like I said, I wrote my law school thesis on patents in healthcare and I can you know, certainly go back and think of all the late nights, but actually this very week in the US, Congress is holding hearings on patent abuse and unsustainable drug prices. And I was just paying attention to some of the live tweeting before I got on the panel and uh, right now, testifying is AbbVie um, about how their best-selling drug, Humira, has over 257 patents on it and a period of exclusivity that's extending as far as 39 years. So double the normal amount of patent exclusivity that a drug is supposed to get. Um, so these are very live debates, a very live controversy going on in the, in the pharma world. And of course, there are some new wrinkles in the psychedelic space but there's a lot of controversy just generally around patents in pharmaceuticals. Um, and sort of the basis for this controversy, we can kind of map it to those two components of that bargain. So is a company in exchange for getting this patent right, bringing back and giving to the public something that's truly novel and truly non-obvious. And when the public gives that inventor uh, the benefit of this patent right, are they giving something that's sort of fair in exchange? Um, so, you know, starting again just with pharmaceuticals, and then we can kind of expand today to how that applies to psychedelics. Um, and I think Shayla has some of these sort of statistics in one of her articles about how three quarters of all pharma patents go to drugs that already exist. And the patent office grants a lot of low quality patents. So, more than half of them in the pharmaceutical space, for instance, that are granted on a drug, if they're challenged at the administrative board at the patent office, they're invalidated. So there's a lot of patents that are granted that shouldn't have been. Um, and oftentimes the patent E also isn't teaching the public properly how to make and use the invention. So this we see now in the space around the COVID vaccine, because a lot of the information, the pharmaceutical companies are saying, well, this is now trade secret information. This would require more than just opening up our patents. Other people can't actually make and use the invention that we've obtained this monopoly over. And then again, sort of similar to what Abby is trying to defend now today in testimony, this limited monopoly is often not as limited as it's supposed to be. It far exceeds 20 years. There's this concept of patent evergreening. Um, and oftentimes the patent monopoly lasts 
uh, as long as two times uh, as much as it should. So there's uh, you know all these controversies just in the pharmaceutical space before we get to the um, sort of novel ways that they interact in the psychedelic space. Okay, well, uh, that kind of cuts into the next question that I had prepared, which is exactly um, this idea that people that are more defending the, the patents on, on that end of the spectrum are saying, hey, this is not a problem specific to psychedelics, and this is how business have always been done, uh, and that's uh, just the way things are, and that's normally how healthcare uh, advances and moves. And so um, I guess the, the, the question we had, and maybe it's, it's really tied up to what you just said, is what would be our concerns to continue this path of business as usual when it involves uh, psychedelics? And what are some of the risks? Maybe we can move to, to Shayla if she wants to share a little bit. And, and also just coming back, Shayla, if you could give a little bit more of, of insight to why did you start doing those articles? Because I know that a journalist, uh, you know, has obli obligations to an editor, but you can also proactively uh, choose your your stories. So I suspect there is more to what you already shared that inspired you uh, to to write those articles. Sure, sure, yeah. So like Graham said, um, I started seeing this floating around that you know this is just the way things have always been done, and the implication is that. Um, because of that, we wouldn't be concerned because it was just business as usual. And like he said, that's just completely untrue. This is a controversy all the time, including the patenting of natural products. Um, so, you know, this was even a Supreme Court case in 2013. Um, they decided that all of there were patents on on genes. So if a scientist discovered a gene, they could patent it. And there were hundreds of gene patents. And then the Supreme Court decided that actually those patents were invalid. So um, it, it is a controversy and it's something that sometimes gets backpedaled. So it, I think this idea that this is the way things work doesn't mean we shouldn't be raising questions about it. Um, additionally, patents have had different implications at different times in history. And since the 1980s, a lot of policies that the government used to have that would encourage competition have largely uh, gone away. And so because of that, also patents have a different meaning. Um, like Graham said, there's this process called evergreening, which is when you can make a small modification to a drug and you preserve your patent beyond the 20 years. Um, I have the statistic that a study from 2018 found that 78% of new drug patents awarded in the past 10 years were for drugs that already existed. Um, and we have a lot of consolidation of big pharma companies. And so all of these things are problems, even if they're the way that things are being done. And again, from my perspective, perspective, um, this all trickles down to cost and then therefore access. We know in the US, especially, there's a huge problem when it comes to drug prices. Um, Americans spent $535 billion on prescription drugs in 2018. It's probably gone up since then. We know how much these things cost. Even generics cost tons of money. Um, another patenting thing that the pharma companies do is called thicketing. And that's when a company just floods patent offices with applications and it makes it harder for small companies to compete. So just because this is the way things have always been done doesn't mean that we should just say, let's let it continue that way. And I think this applies to all medicine. I think if psychedelics could take a stand and say, we wanna do this in a more ethical way, it could maybe trickle into other mental health care. Um, and to your point, like, Again, I live in the US, so it's kind of a particular situation here, but I'm a person who's tried to access therapy my whole life and just had to pay tons and tons of money for it. I mean, tons and tons of money because it's rarely covered by in-network insurance. If you wanna see a special therapist and you wanna see them for any reasonable amount of time, you are paying out of pocket, you have thousand dollar deductibles to pay first off. And in my reporting, I've talked to lots of people with all different kinds of mental health concerns and they all tell me, over and over, like, I can't afford this, I can't afford this. So when you have something really exciting hitting the market, you just want it to be available to as many people as possible. That's kind of the point. Um, and so when you have all of these companies starting to say, we're just going to do things the way it's always been done, uh, that's a huge red flag, because it's like the way things have been done has been really, really bad. Really awesome. Can you just clarify, you mentioned one word that was a bit technical. Sorry that I'm not a native speaker, but I've, I imagine others too. You said it's a process of thickening or licking. Uh, oh, thicketing. Tic ticketing. 
thicketing, it's T-H-I-C-K-E-T. So like when there's a really thick bush or you're like walking through a thicket. So it's essentially when a company that has a lot of resources will flood the patent office with patent applications. And if you're a little company with less money, it's kind of harder to get, you know, you just send in one patent application, you're, you're just not as competitive. So thicketing is kind of like, I think the metaphor there is you're like creating this large, dense bramble of bushes that other people can't get through. But it's part exactly. of the- yeah, it's those 257 patents that AbbVie has that cover Humira. Yeah. So if a generic wants to launch a generic version of Humira, they would have to figure out how to challenge and potentially invalidate 257 applications. Got it. And what about you, David? Uh, you you came out with this um, with this statement that was pretty strong, and you you are a guy that let's say understands the world of business and have your your company. What motivated you? Uh, what do you think of this idea? Oh, well, that's always how things were done and we should keep, you know, just that's how it works. And if you don't have patents, it's not competitive and you can't attract money from investors and you can't make this sustainable. What is your opinion about all of this? Is there something specific to psychedelics that you think is different? Well, yeah, I, you know, I agree with pretty much all the points that have been made here. And uh, yeah, I think absolutely, um, you know, capitalism does need to shift generally to uh, a multi-stakeholder model and internalize the social and environmental costs that right now are all too often externalized to maximize uh, profit for shareholders as a sole and only basic stakeholder in a, in a for-profit. Um, that needs to change generally and certainly for psychedelics. Um, you know, these, uh, you know, these allies and body consciousness and earth care and people care and connection. And, you know, there's a real opportunity here to do things in the correct way and, and set an example, not only for the psychedelic uh, ecosystem, but um, for, for business generally. And um, yeah, I really appreciated Shayla's uh, observations about access. I think that's crucial is to make sure that we're building access into these models and maps. That's a that's a very key concern to not only make it economically accessible, but culturally accessible, make sure we have therapists of color and LBGTQ that uh, you know relevant populations feel comfortable ac accessing. Um, then the, the um, Nagoya protocol, like trying to leverage that, which is uh, you know supposedly. Um, if you're making money off of a molecule that's a bio, part of a biocultural tradition, that tradition, that in, you know, generally indigenous tradition, is supposed to benefit. Um, that really needs to be part of this. Um, and then open source, which is, I think, kind of the fundamental point here of this panel, that especially when we're talking about molecules that have been in, you know, have, have you know, millennia of safe use, um, and these are clearly in a public domain, the 60s saw a, a, a flourishing of research in pretty much every single conceivable area. Area, There is no unknown condition here that people are developing, you know, these psychedelic medicines for. So this is all, you know, prior, prior art, prior, you know, and in the public domain. So a couple of different efforts that are relevant to, let's say, checking the kind of bad actors is uh, Freedom to Operate is a website. I put the URL in the chat. That's Kerry Turnbull. He's um, on the board of Hefter and USONA. And USONA is a nonprofit bringing uh, psilocybin through FDA approval process. He's also got Be More. That's working for psilocybin for, for alcoholism. Um, and then, um, you know, MAPS is another example of, of a nonprofit uh, uh, owned that's, that's capitalizing through philanthropy and then so and then eventually impact loans. There's other ways to be capitalizing um, the the costs of drug development than just you know uh, doing an IPO and uh, selling equity in 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 a, in a model that's just all about profit maximization. There are there are plenty of investors out there that want to deploy capital in an in impact first way and are interested in maximizing return and. That absolutely should be tapped to scale these companies, um, and which again, Maps is showing how to do it, and, and others. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, there, there was another major point I wanted to make here, but um, 
Um, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, oh yeah, well, just returning. So Carrie Turnbull, so Freedom to Operate is uh, been beating back to Compass uh, patents. So that's a really good uh, organization to support. Um, and then Porta Sophia, I put that URL into the uh, chat. So that's come together with uh, different stakeholders coming together to basically centralize a database of all the different psychedelic research uh, so that patent offices have an easy resource to go to determine prior art and can, uh, you know, kind of like, a, a, how do you say, a counter to this thicketing and these different tactics that companies will use to confuse patent offices. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I, I am grateful to, to everyone here and the movement in general. I think we, we, we can kind of check these bad practices and, um, how to say capitalize the right kind of players that really set a good example, but we're going to have to be diligent and it's going to be an ongoing battle. So, oh, and, and one final thing is that, um, you know, Bob Jesse and, and the Council for Spiritual Practices, I mean, that's really the origin of the, okay, we need to generate clinical data for efficacy of psilocybin and take it through FDA, you know, get FDA approved clinical trials. And this is what's going to destigmatize the culture. But that, you know, it came from a spiritual place and, and taking these medicines through FDA approval process, of course, you know, that's very important in and of themselves to, to treat these, you know, suffering populations and acute mental health crises with PTSD and treating resistant depression and, you know, end of life anxiety. But these medicines are for all of us. We're all struggling with the dilemmas of life. And there's, you know, the FDA medical pharma model is not the only way to access. And arguably the one and done model is, is quite inadequate compared to say like the Native American church or Santo Daime and, and the church model that holds these medicines in the way that indigenous traditions do. And you can re routinely access them as more of a life path in, in, in community healing and having mutual support. Um, and so that's a real problem when these for-profit actors start trying to not only monopolize the medicines within the medical pharma frame, but then try to like interfere with say organs therapeutic model or decriminalization measures or, or retreats in Amsterdam, like, or in Netherlands, like synthesis. So just as another, another problem to be on the watch for. Uh, thank you, David. Well, I imagine that uh, there was a lot of backstages for before you launching that, uh, that piece publicly. I know that's uh, kind of hot on the, on the psychedelic field. Uh, I think a lot of people are uh, having these conversations, and again, it's hard to to put things in print in writing. Uh, and <laughs> this is part of the challenge, I think, for us to um, produce materials to help guide the conversation. So, I think all of these uh, publications have been an important step. I want to move to Ali. Uh, do you want to say anything about um, this concept of business as usual, or comment on your colleagues' remarks? Uh, on this round of questions still? Yeah, sure. Um, firstly, yeah, grateful for all those remarks and, and a really nice um, tapestry of different uh, angles to this. I, I guess maybe the best thing I can add is, is to take a, a more a zoomed out view and perhaps give the kind of the more maybe philosophical or sociological perspective. So, well, as I'm listening and as I'm kind of inquiring into this for myself, um, I, I keep becoming astonished in some way that we're having this conversation and that the psychedelic community it, of all communities is, is um, in the position we're in. Because one thing that psychedelics do is take us out of business as usual and show us new ways to do things. And I think a really useful frame that I found is, is the work of um, John Verveke, uh, we've had on Rebel Wisdom quite a few times. He's a uh, professor of cognitive science at the University of Toronto. And if anyone wants uh, to watch a brilliant YouTube series, he, he created a series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, which is like 50 lectures long. Um, and part of, so the, part of the premise is that we are living through a crisis of meaning in culture in the sense of we don't know what the purpose is of, of our culture. Um, and we also have a, a profound sense of disconnection from each other and from the world. And so arguably our mental health crises are, are a symptom of that and, and many other things. So one thing he points out is that there are different practices um, 
that help us change our frame of reference. And a good way to think of it is like wearing a pair of glasses. So if you're wearing a pair of glasses and you're looking through them, and we might be looking through them in the sense of we're looking through business as usual, old school pharma model, um, old school way of bringing drugs to market, old school way of looking at what health is and what's wrong with us in the first place, our frame is broken. Our frame is absolutely broken. Uh, if our frame wasn't broken, we wouldn't need new drugs to treat all of the, the, the struggles we're going through. Our, pharmace our psychiatric drugs don't work very well. And our sense of purpose, uh, direction and connection in culture is also broken. So that's the frame arguably we're looking through. Certain practices like mindfulness, for example, help us take those glasses off and look at our frame and go, oh, wow, yeah, our, my frame is broken. I'm looking through dusty glasses, scrub them off, put them back on. And, and practices like concentration meditations are about kind of zooming into your frame. So psychedelics can do both of those things. Psychedelics have the potential for us to look at our frames and challenge them. And there are, of course, realities. It's not a simple thing. We, you know, we have systems that we're embedded in that we have to work with in some way, which, you know, I think is just a reality of the situation. But I think the deal that people made over the last 15, 20 years was, and I think David spoke to it a bit, and certainly it's what I witnessed, um, was let's do the medical thing and everyone stop being weird and please just play it cool and we'll get this done. And you know, that's that's great. We, that, that probably was the right decision to make to really go down the mainstream route, to really go down the medic medicalization route. But now I think we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And what we're throwing out is the transformative potential of what psychedelics can bring to our systems, not just to our our mental health and to our, um, yeah, the way we, we approach um, how we treat mental health. And I think the other thing is that if we only look at psychedelics as tools that are going to help ment our mental health treatment, I think we're going to be very disappointed in five to 10 years, because as we're already seeing in the clinical trials, it's not the psychedelics, it's the psychedelics in combination with therapy and it's not even just the psychedelics in combination with therapy. It's, as Bennett Zellner has pointed out, a much broader system of what kind of world are you going back to after your treatment? And if the world and the life you're going back to after your treatment is going to send you right back into your depression, which it often does, more than is reported in all the glowing press, um, we're back to the same problem. And what we're looking for, again, is the kind of numbing quick fix of um, an SSRI. So we can't look at the psychedelic renaissance, I think, in terms just of medicalization, and we can't look at them as normal medicines because they're not. So I think the business as usual argument for me, it's so much deeper than just the current ways we bring drugs to market. It's about how we even look at health and well-being, um, sickness, uh, how we look at how things are interconnected. So the if there was ever a time to say that business as usual uh, shouldn't really be factoring into our decision making. I think it's now with with psychedelic medicine. So um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that for that point. Awesome. And, and just to talk about business as usual, it's also in this kind of COVID time, what is usual uh, is also another point because we are also moving into some kind of mega uncertainty as a, I think as a whole, as societies, I think there's a lot up in the air and people are, are are thinking a lot about all kinds of things and there's not a world as usual anymore for for any of us. Uh, I think, you know, you all addressed a lot of points that we had divided into questions. So I'm going to uh, switch a bit the the focus because it's hard to break in top, you know, specific questions and I'm going to surprise um, Graham with a hard question. Are you ready, Graham? I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Well, you are a lawyer working for patents uh, mm -hmm. companies. So how do you navigate that tension? And do you go and choose your, your clients by, oh, okay, maybe this is a ethical IP or this is not, uh, but I suppose that the clients with more money <laughs> are also the clients that are able to pay you better fees and pr probably maybe have more aggressive 
big pharma corporate strategies. So where do you stand and how do you navigate this tension between the intellectual you, uh, the Twitter you, and the one that has to run a business on patents? Well, that's a really good question. And um, I'm glad I do spend a little time thinking about it since it wasn't on our prep sheet. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a big part of it is I have the good fortune of having worked for big law firms for over a decade and now have a bit of luxury of not having to worry about taking clients solely for monetary reasons. So I can think about working with clients who I feel more aligned with. Um, but you know, I, I do feel, and I think maybe I'll steal from one of my answers to one of our later questions, which is you know, one of the things we can do to sort of um, combat the bad actors and that's leading ourselves with good actions. Um, and you know, that's one thing that I hope to be able to do myself is kind of model the behavior of what a lawyer working ethically, ethically can do in this space. Um, and, you know, of course, as a lawyer, I have a, a duty by my oath, sort of when I take the bar, which is to zealously advocate for my client, but I do try to balance that to some degree with what I see as the broader ethos of the psychedelics space and hopefully be able to work with clients to encourage them to, when they're filing for patents, file for patents in a way that's going to be to the benefit, not only of their bottom line in a profit maximizing winner take all sort of way, but also broadening um, sort of what uh, Ali mentioned, the, you know, the transformational potential of uh, the compounds that they're, they're patenting. And I'm, you know, I'm fortunate that I have been able to choose and be able to work with some good clients. And I guess I should say rather that some clients have you know, chosen me to work with, but um, you know, going back, I guess, to the question you asked the others about some of the risks, I mean, I certainly see the risks that others have brought up around um, costs and access. And you know, one of, the, one of the biggest concerns that I've had in sort of building again off what Ali said about um, the, you know, the transformational uh, sort of possibilities of psychedelics, I see that the way patents typically can be used in enforcing monopoly you know, monopolies really work to beget monocultures. And that was, you know, one of the issues that I saw when I started in cannabis and thinking about how to keep a Monsanto from taking over um, that sort of industry. And, and, you know, one of the concerns, I guess, to sort of put into uh, more specifics that I, that I carry is having seen sort of in my, in my younger days, I guess, aging me a little bit, the sort of promise of the early internet and the transformative process promise there um, of being kind of a decentralized democratic, like potentially leading to a more equitable world, a, I mean, potentially a weirder world, a weirder culture, more diverse culture, giving power uh, away from the established hierarchies towards individual creators. And, and now, you know, looking out at what the internet's become with just these big companies, Facebook, Apple, Google, um, and it's you know, not entirely or necessarily because of patents, but that sort of concentration of wealth and information and, and power and decision-making um, is something that patents can also tend to lead toward. So that's you know, something I keep in, in my mind. And you know, part of why I'm interested in this space is because of my experience with psychedelics. So part of what I try to do is certainly bring my hopes for the transformational possibilities that psychedelics can have to, you know, the work I do when I work with clients to hopefully be filing for patents in an ethical way. Yeah, that's really wonderful because uh, lawyers do really play a huge role in this whole patent war. And I, I want to uh, refer everybody to the NAS emergent psychedelic bar association that is being created by our colleagues at MAPS and Chakruna, uh, called this, the Psychedelic Bar Association, where they're trying to uh, call lawyers to take an ethical pledge and be inspired by the North Star Pledge. And as they join uh, this association, stimulate to think of better ways to practice law and make law also an instrument, a tool of justice and equity and access and not just business as usual. So I think at the same time that there is a lot of 
money grab and power grab, there's a, a lot of other initiatives uh, being born uh, to counter that. And wanted to go back to, to Shayla. You have mentioned, I, I was a bit struck when you said uh, uh, that in our, in our conversation, our, our, our meeting, that it, this is not even about a, a philosophical question about psychedelics, like is this right for psychedelics? It's, it's independent for you. It's independent in a way and beyond the whole, uh, you know, uh, psychedelic concern with our medicines or our sacraments and how can you do this to psychedelics that for you, all those cultural issues or philosophical implications were not even at the center because it's, it's more about access. So can you talk more about that? You already said a bit about that, but explore that and also the idea of legitimate patents, if you can delve a little bit more into those things. Sure, yeah. And, you know, I think that my my positioning here on that is kind of that um, if we really want to be solutions oriented, uh, it could be it could be helpful to really think about problem solving in terms of what are the concrete issues that it arises. So things like access, cost, um, that applies to even legalization and decriminalization, as well as medicalization. And one of the reasons I feel this way is that I think that um, one of the side effects of the mainstreaming of psychedelics, whether that's through medicalization or decriminalization, is that more people are going to be drawn to these substances in the first place maybe become curious about them uh, that, that never would have before. Um, and I think that we should be prepared or be thinking about a wider variety of meaning making when it comes to these substances. Um, I think what Ali said about uh, you know, this lack of meaning and interconnectedness is totally true, but based on individual backgrounds, people might inter interpret that in different ways. And it could be that somebody, you know, I've sp spoken with lots of researchers who talk to people who this was a really significant event in their life, but it's just because um, you know they're not addicted to cocaine anymore. It doesn't really have that much to do with their interconnectedness to people as a whole. And so that, that doesn't mean that their way of meaning making is illegitimate, but I think that we should be um, advocating for ethics on the basis of not only philosophy and culture and, and these other aspects, but about, about cost and access and making things equitable and accessible for all. Um, I've written about this a lot, how some of the dominant meaning making in the West has its ties to Aldous, Hug uh, Aldous Huxley and even people like Bill Richards at Johns Hopkins um, and the hood mysticism scale. And, you know, they're, they call psychedelics cultural amplifiers for a reason. And there's, uh, you know, there's also cases where that's not true. For example, one of the people who stormed the Capitol um, was a heavy psychedelics user. And, you know, he became this figure of like right wing psychedelic culture. And so I think that there are lots of reasons to be wary about patents and to be concerned about the commodification of them and to say that they don't work well with capitalism, but just the philosophy of psychedelics on its own um, is not is not the only place that we should be should be springing from. And I think it also prevents us from finding other middle grounds in which there might be ethical ways to move forward that do sometimes involve patents. And this is something that I've learned, you know, I'm grateful to Graham for teaching me a lot about, about IP commons and how to create ethics pledges and really hold people accountable. Um, things that might feel philosophically contrary to what psychedelics seems to stand for, but could be ways to move forward that actually tackle some of the, the main problems that we have. So I think that just boiling it down to patent or not to patent can miss some of these, these middle roads. And even Rick Doblin has said that when it comes to MDMA, they haven't decided yet if they are ideologically opposed to patents, if they come up with some novel way to create MDMA, they might want to patent that because they have a public benefit corporation within their nonprofit that could help generate the money to do all the good work that they do. They're another good example of people that are doing the FDA route. And at the same time, they, they promote legalization and they're doing tons of social justice work. So I don't think that we have to pick um, just one of these buckets. I think that ethics should be an overarching theme and then that can be explored in many different ways. Wow, really, really interesting. I also wanna make a surprise question for David and, and you please just answer whatever feels good to you. Uh, but I know that there has been a lot of backstages, you know, uh, conversations in like philanthropic circles and among the influential people that, that are leaders of the psychedelic movement. And uh, in the past, people challenged MAPS and Rick Doblin for supporting Compass or kind of uh, not really supporting and promoting, but letting them, you know, act freely 
And there was also talk that like people were trying to influence maps to totally stand out of it. Uh, is there anything you can share in terms of the backstages, the leadership conversations? Uh, there was the open science statement that Bob Jesse put out. And then there was the, those early controversies about supporting Compass or not. And in a way, is it, did we sort of miss the chance to raise these questions before or it doesn't matter and we should think from now on? Is there anything, do you, do you know what I'm trying to, to ask? Yeah, totally. And, and then let me maybe comment on, on your couple other questions uh, uh, as well. Um, and, and then I'll answer that. Like first uh, to the question you posed, Graham, I mean, I, it reminded me of Marx's um, statement of the effect that the bourgeois, uh, like some of the bourgeois are at the vanguard of the revolution, not that, you know, that a lot of us recognize the privilege we have in, in our equitable system. And, and work to leverage and use our privilege to, to make it better. Um, and that's the, the choice all of us, you know, have, you know, whether or not we're gonna just kind of coast and, you know, make things better for ourselves, or are we gonna, you know, leverage what we have to, to make things better for the world? Um, and yeah, and, and Shayla's points, I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, there's nothing inherent in psychedelics, unfortunately. Well, I mean, uh, there, there's a potential inherent within psychedelics and that's I think why we're all in the game here to really open our hearts and minds and connect us to nature and each other and you know be truly transformative on an individual and collective level but you know there are these you know the QAnon shaman and Charles Manson and plenty of examples I'm sure in all of our personal lives of like wow psychedelics really aren't really helping you and uh, you know can be very inflationary to the shadow and um, so yeah you know spiritual bypassing and and you know, not really shifting behavior or politics or, you know, really accounting for the, the needs and lives of our fellow, you know, brothers and sisters and siblings and, and non-human, you know, fellow beings on this planet. Um, yeah, there's nothing automatic, you know, about this. I mean, we all have to do the integration work and take the lessons that we learn and apply them and shift our behavior and there's nothing automatic about that. And so I think, you know, there, there's a lot of hard work to, you know, have these tools, but to employ them to actually make the kind of society we want to live in. Um, you know, as far as maps, um, I, you know, that the patent discussion was purely in terms of blocking, like basically being able to uh, have, enable access to people we believe are philosophically aligned versus not, um, it, you know, like the conversations resolving in, in a not patenting uh, uh, direction, but that would be the, the, the reason for MAPS to do it, um, just to be able, and, but then the patent would not be on the molecule itself. It would only be on a synthesis route. So, I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, and that's ultimately what, you know, Compass, you know, for all their efforts to, you know, actually patent the molecule, I mean, that's not going to work. They're going to, end up with, you know, whatever's unique to their synthesis route. And, you know, USANA has already got their own synthesis route and, um, you know, this is not going to work out. So, I mean, that, the whole idea of these patents, I mean, in a way, it's just like not going to work when you're talking about a molecule uh, that's already in the public domain. Anyway, with, with the kind of, uh, I think, uh, watchdogs that we have in the space. So it's just, I don't know who's advising or why Compass in a time you, you know, the pursuing these strategies because they're not working. They're just, one, they're not going to work, and two, they're just creating incredible ill will within the movement. Um, as far as compass and maps, yeah, I mean, I, you know, when uh, the, uh, I, I forget the author, but the 2018 article in Vice and, and Compass, you know, that kind of really opened my eyes. And, but, you know, I, I guess I gave George and Katya the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, there was a, a, there was a moment when they were, in dialogue with the MAPS board and, you know, their patent had not yet been public. And, you know, we asked directly, are you trying to block USONA with your patent or is it, you know, are you just patenting, you know, whatever is unique to your synthesis? And, you know, we're, we're assured, he assured that, that they were not trying to occupy the field and block anybody. And, you know, when that turned out to not be true, I mean, that's what really lit, you know, like that was it for me personally. And, you know, we've been supporting Kerry Turnbull and, and the freedom to operate. Um, as far as the overall shift in maps, I mean, it's been a process. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's really becoming very crystal clear throughout the organization that 
yeah, Compass is not to be trusted. They're, you know, not only on the patent front, but, you know, their academic proxies are advocating. Um, Alan Young and, 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 and Ali wrote an incredible article here uh, countering this, this article that came out um, by a couple academic researchers sponsored by Compass um, that were, you know, attacking basically the synthesis and organ model and, you know, kind of making, and, and, and actually there's a real precedent for their behavior. Um, GW Pharma, it was a, was a, a company that came into cannabis and actually hired Andrea Barthwell, which was the drug wars, um, or how do you say the ONDCP, the Office of National Drug Control Policies, drug czar under Bush, um, actually hired her to advocate that only their cannabis extracts were safe and that medical marijuana in its raw form was just totally unsafe and couldn't be trusted. And, and, you know, and it was just this ridiculous situation and that went nowhere and they're just a bit player in the movement, but it's a very similar dynamic. We're just seeing, um, you know, efforts here to try to undercut other avenues of integrating medicine uh, into the culture. Um, but anyways, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, as far as, you know, personally, I've not been a fan of Compass for a while. And I think organizationally, um, that, I mean, I think for a while there was, uh, you know, uh, coordination just on a kind of on the research agenda and sharing like, you know, how to approach regulatory agencies and all that kind of things. But I think um, just recent events have really snowballed. So, you know, everyone's going through their process of understanding, like, uh, you know, it's one thing, you know, it's one thing when people say things, but then, you know, actions speak way louder than wor words. And, I think the actions are speaking very clearly for everybody, even those who are maybe in a little more denial than others. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, there's so many layers just for people that are not familiar. So David uh, sits on the board of MAPS and also has supported research with USONA. So he has multiple hats. I think this is a kind of panel that we can replay and then try to learn and study. It could be like played on a class for students because there's a lot to unpack. Uh, I, I just really want to celebrate that we're over 100 people here. That's really exciting. Um, also want to encourage everybody to paste your questions in, in questions and answers, and we will be moving uh, soon uh, to questions and answers. I, I would like to, to make a generic question also to, to everybody, which is part of our roots, and, and talk about um, uh, this idea that can different systems coexist? Can we have the, the, the avenue of clinical trials and FDA approved and medicalization, but also at the same time, uh, legalization and at the same time, uh, maybe religious freedom or indigenous uh, rights over sacraments and uh, traditional plant medicine use? Uh, how do you see the possibility of the coexistence of these different systems? And does one necessarily mean that the other won't prevail? And maybe we can bring Ali back to it and maybe you could speak a little about what is your article? Well, why, what did you do in that article? And what do you think of this idea of uh, different systems coexisting, including indigenous therapeutic uh, underground uh, FDA, all of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing is I think they can and probably should coexist. And I, there are a few examples of, of where I think different approaches to personal growth and healing also coexist, which I can go into. Um, but yeah, the, so the article, um, so um, James Rucker and Alan Young uh, to psychiatrists at King's College and the Maudsley here in the UK. Um, and James Rucker runs or ran one of the psilocybin trials that happened in the UK a couple of years ago and is planning another one. Um, uh, one was Compass funded, the other one isn't Compass funded. So they wrote an article uh, in Frontiers in Psychiatry, which was... Um, uh, to, to keep it simple, basically the argument was that legal retreat centers shouldn't be offering psilocybin assisted experiences before psilocybin has gone through the clinical trial process. So the, there was a 
a bit more complexity to the argument. Um, and there were some good points, but overall my response was that, and I, I think this is taps into a wider theme in the psychedelic space. My response was that it was effectively uh, an appeal to authority, which is a, a kind of logical fallacy, which is, is basically we're psychiatrists. The clinical trial model is the way that we bring new drugs to market safely. Uh, and therefore, effectively, we should be in control of access. Um, and the clinical trial process, even though we might be biased towards this, the clinical trial process is so good and so robust that it uh, it means that our bias is mitigated. So I disagree with that quite strongly for, for various reasons, um, partly because it's um, it illegitimizes other approaches and other ways of accessing psychedelics. It also I think the bigger theme is that it creates a, a narrative control, whether intentional or not, around what psychedelics are and what they're for. And this is actually a point Eric Davis made really well in The Rise of Psychedelic Capitalism uh, that really stuck with me, that whoever controls the narrative around psychedelics actually controls the experience. And that's probably true of some other things in the world, but I think it's more true of psychedelics than, than most things. And it's it was a bit of an eye opener for me because, you know, you are effectively controlling the set if you're saying psychedelics are in the domain primarily of psychiatry and, and the medical establishment. And then once that's been established, everyone else can use it. That automatically creates a narrative that these are for something and and completely illegitimizes the narrative uh, simultaneously that, you know, many simultaneous approaches that could be happening at the same time. So I like the phrase clinics and churches, and I think they can and should coexist. Now, I think clinical medicine and psychiatry and psychology are for perhaps for one of a better term for the Western mind, the best ways we have of, of dealing with people who are very unwell. And I think it's really important that that keeps going. But for the people that, that I'm trained to work with, which is called healthy neurotics, which is kind of the rest of us who might be struggling with something. We're all, we're all, everyone here is a healthy neurotic, apparently. So we're all struggling with something and we all want to grow as people. We all want to look at our, well, you know, we want to go through a process of looking at our shadows. We want to um, understand the universe better. That is not a medicalized approach. And so the frame that, that I think is, is maybe useful is, is, you know, the world I come from, the personal growth world of, of, you know, where you might go to a two day retreat to really tap into a, a certain aspect of yourself or really connect with other people and, and be in this kind of third space of a retreat that you then bring back into your life. You know, when we run retreats at Rebel Wisdom, we have a, a form that people fill out. And this is similar to what legal retreats do, most good legal retreats, a form that screens people who we're not qualified to work with. And we go, wow, okay, this person has a lot of trauma or this person is really struggling right now there's a humility of going, I'm not qualified to work with this person, but they could be referred to, for example, a, um, a clinic, a psychedelic clinic. So there could be, and I think really easily could be an ecosystem of legal retreats that are referring people who really need it to a clinic where they're going to get a different type of therapy and, and also then religious use, because who's to say what someone's religious use is or not? And if everyone's talking to each other and the ecosystem is healthy, like a healthy forest, then we're in a good place. The problem is when one aspect of the ecosystem becomes like an invasive species. Um, and this is actually a metaphor that I'm borrowing from Rosalind Watts, who kind of blew my mind with this metaphor the other day. It's effectively like having a eucalyptus tree. You know, some, an approach that, for example, Compass Pathways is taking is, in my opinion, a bit like a eucalyptus tree that's just like, invading the rest of the ecosystem and trying to take more resources than it needs to and so that is that is the issue so th there needs to be i think a kind of dynamic equilibrium and i think that's probably what most people in the space are reacting against and pushing for it's not get rid of capitalism completely most of the time it's not get rid of any patents at any point like personally i think patents for new chemical entities are a good idea like if someone spends eight years developing uh a new type of ketamine or MDMA, uh, which is safer and more effective, et cetera, then, and they've put all that work and sacrifice um, and risk into it, then, you know, that's something that I would feel more comfortable with. Psilocybin is, is not a new chemical um, and has a rich history of indigenous countercultural um, and religious use. So that's, that's also part of the issue, I think. 
Yeah, I, I am WhatsApping with Anya here uh, on the side. I just want to take the liberty to make one comment here because it's an anecdote and I like to tell stories. I was recently on this paper, this panel uh, with, it was like the biggest gig of my life. I was truly honored. It was an NPR debate and it was Rick Doblin and I against the ex head of the American Psychiatrists Association and uh, Kevin Sabet, who is like a main um, uh, drug policy czar uh, advisor to uh, Clinton, Bush and Obama. And this medical doctor, he kept on saying, well, how do you know that psychedelics make people better? And there is no evidence for that. There is no research for that. How do you know that it makes you more creative? I mean, people can invent all kinds of things. <laughs> and then when the conversation was off camera, but he kept on saying, but I'm not a prohibitionist and I have personal firsthand experience. And then uh, when the, co the camera was off, Rick asked him, uh, how was your personal experience? He said, well, that was very good. <laughs> And then Rick said, but how do you know? Do you have a, a peer reviewed paper proving that it was very good? <laughs> so uh, that, <laughs> that conversation reminded me that paper of, uh, you know, about legal retreats and psilocybin, it re reminds me a little bit of that. Uh, like science trying to, to say, you know, there is the scientific evidence but versus the reality that is happening. And also it's important to remind that clinical trials and this model of double blind placebo uh, uh, kind of researches from like the 30s and 40s. And uh, it was a creation, you know, to try to select the new substances that were emerging. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to, to, to use the model of clinical trials to talk about substances that have been around since ever and, you know, that have large uh, empirical use. We also published an article uh, criticizing Michael Pollan when when he came out and said, "Hey, that's too fast with decriminalization." I was like, "All right," and I I do like Mike Pollan and have a good relation to him, uh, but we're also asking like, "Oh, okay, we, this idea that you need clinical trials to prove, you know, the legitimacy of substances that have been used since immemorial times uh, doesn't really work." Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to <laughs> to throw that in in the mix of the idea of can medicalization coexist with legalization, and I I, I want to move towards more the conclusion with uh, passing the word again to everybody to comment on two things. What do we do towards what we consider bad actors, and what is your hopes and dreams for the future? How do you think we move forward? What is next? What should we work for? What are you working for? What do you dream for? And I'm gonna start with Graham again. You're mute. The most heard phrase of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so gosh, I, um, I mean, I think some of the ways that we can challenge um, what's happening now uh, have been discussed. So some of the things we can do is to just participate more in patent examination because we know that patent examination itself is a flawed system. So for instance, David mentioned how Porta Sofia is a resource for bringing prior art to the attention of patent examiners. And Freedom to Operate is an organization that's looking to challenge applications uh, another thing we can do is try to um, push for reform of the patent system itself. I mean, this is a much bigger uh, sort of burden to try to carry, but there are many people out there who are doing it now, of course, because of the difficulties in the pharmaceutical space at large. Um, so joining forces with them. For instance, uh, you know, I think we heard a little bit about how a patent on psilocybin may not really be something that is really worth that reward of getting a patent on because of the fact that psilocybin's a known compound and it's something that's been used for uh, you know hundreds of years, millennia, and obviously has a, a huge amount of tradition behind it. Um, 
in the US, there's no real way to balance that from a policy perspective, but other countries are working towards that. So for instance, in India, there actually is part of the Patent Act that says if you have a new use or a new form of a known drug, the only way you can get a patent on it is by showing that it has something significantly different, something, an advantage in efficacy over the known drug. And actually, there was one of the most well-known cases that took advantage of this part of the patent law to challenge a patent um, involved a cancer drug, Gleevec, where the prior drug um, or the prior compound, imatinib, was not on patent. And Novartis filed a patent on a beta crystalline form, a polymorph of Gleevec. And they spent six years litigating in the Indian Supreme Court whether or not they could get a patent on a polymorph of this known drug. And the Indian Patent Office or the Supreme Court said that the Patent Office was right to deny them the ability to get a patent on a polymorph because it didn't show any new substantial improvement in efficacy. And that was applauded by the WHO, by Medicine Sans Frontieres, by activists around the world who have since put that provision into the patent laws of some other countries. Um, so things like that could be broader, more systemic changes to the patent system. Um, and of course, uh, there are some ways we can also act, I think, within the, the psychedelic space and with the patent system that we have now. Um, so Shayla mentioned, and she's written about um, the possibility of having an IP commons. So there are ways that companies can work together with the IP that they get to um, use that IP in ethical ways. So one of the panels um, that I listened to at Shakuna's um, Sacred Plants of the Americas conference last month that uh, David, you were on, um, David Heldreth talked about how his company, Panacea Plant Sciences, was filing patents on compounds and then giving those patents, assigning them to indigenous groups so that they would have control over them. Um, so that's like an example of a way that patents could be used in an ethical way. And there's been um, other, uh, other things written, for instance, by Journey Collab about how patents can be used um, in an ethical way. Um, so, you know, besides these ideas of an IP commons, you know, there's, there's other ways that patents can be used once they're owned in ethical ways, ethical licensing. Um, so, you know, one example, for instance, the Broad Institute, which has patents on CRISPR, they've made sure that they license their patents to researchers and nonprofits for free. Um, they have kind of a balancing test when they license them to industry. And then they have certain things that they won't license for at all. For instance, like Terminator seeds for modifying tobacco or human germlines. So there's a variety of things where companies can choose. And of course, the way patents are used by default is for profit maximization, for this winner take all competition, but that's a choice that the patent owner makes. So there are ways to encourage patent owners to use their patents in ethical ways. So I guess one of the questions you asked was sort of what our hopes for would be for ourselves. I mean, so, you know, my hope for, for myself is to be able to work uh, ethically with companies who are interested in using their own IP in ethical ways or finding ways to work within the, the patent system um, in an in, in ethical way. So, you know, that would be the way that I would hope to be of service to the space is by um, helping companies to work in, in an ethical way um, with their IP. Thank you, Graham. Um, maybe we could hear David and uh, what are your thoughts on like Journey Collab or David Heldreth or where are you putting your money and your philanthropic dollars and your libido next? What is your hopes? What, what, what are your dreams yeah. for this space? Yeah, right on. And you know, I saw a comment on the indigenous, uh, you know, like you know what that we're not uh, really talking about um, the indigenous stakeholders and rights. And um, yeah, I think that's crucial here for the psychedelic renaissance and movement. Is you know, and I, I think it's a real test for the movement to make sure that as the renaissance unfolds and demand right now is spiking in a huge way for, for plant medicines that, you know, and, and then of course we're, 
you know, different companies are, are bringing molecules through regulatory approval process to, you know, profit from that these indigenous traditions, you know, rather than be seeing their medicine stripped from the wild and cultures disrupted, you know, how can we make sure that they're benefiting, that we're in respectful relationship, um, you know, really, really learning their lessons of how they hold the medicine in such a prayerful, reverential way and are in a much better, sustainable, connected relationship with nature. And this indigenous way of being and healing and relating is kind of the, the healing antidote to the malaise of the Western disconnection and alienation you know, from ourselves and each other in, in, in the natural world. Um, and so we're forming, well, well first of all, uh, really, really uh, you know, psyched by Chakuna's uh, Indigenous Re Reciprocity Initiative. And uh, that's one way that the psychedelic movement and ecosystem can plug in and help and, and Chakuna has uh, identified as something like 40 nonprofits, indigenous led nonprofits working in North and South America on indigenous medicine and biocultural preservation. Um, the other major project in this uh, area is uh, the Indigenous Conservation Medicine Fund that we're gonna be putting together, or is being put together. Um, that's gonna raise significant funds uh, from philanthropists and hopefully from for-profit psychedelic companies as well uh, for the benefit of, gen of uh, you know, in, in consultation uh, with indigenous stakeholders and, and under the, following their leadership, um, funding some you know, real infrastructural projects. So for example, with POD Medicine, which is in a state of collapse in the wild, um, you know, how, how can we help support the Native American church and the indigenous led effort to, you know, conserve their medicine and uh, harvest it, you know, as they educate their membership on correct harvesting and build out nurseries and cultivation and, uh, uh, you know, just really help support them uh, financially and otherwise. Uh, similarly with the Amazon and, and tribes in the Amazon with ayahuasca that's being stripped, uh, ayahuasca vines and Iboga is also in really bad shape in Gabon. Um, and uh, yeah, and there is this Nagoya protocol that, you know, the indigenous traditions are supposed to benefit from uh, companies that profit from molecules that belong to their or originated from their traditions. So I think that's huge. Um, and uh, yeah, and then just access is another huge, uh, you know, hopefully the movement as we unfold that we do prioritize uh, access and make sure that marginalized populations feel comfortable and, and it's economically possible to access the healing that these medicines offer, uh, you know, open source. And yeah, just generally speaking that we psychedelically heal and, and open the global citizenry in a, in a mega way so that we are much more connected and respectful of each other and not demonizing each other, and, uh, enacting or enacting policies and collective behavior change that, um, can really start to address the massive environmental and social problems we're facing. So uh, yeah, that's that's my hopes that that this medicine can really, you know, be this kind of ally for humanity uh, to to really be all we can be, and uh, rather than go off the climate change cliff and all this inequality and racism and just you know you know homelessness and just all these things that really just need to stop, and hopefully we can be the last generation of uh, you know, these systemic problems. Thank you, David. And for all, you know, what you, everybody that knows a bit about you knows your big heart and how much you have influenced this field. I wanna put in the chat here an invitation for everybody to come to this webinar uh, that uh, Bronner and Miriam from River Sticks Foundation are organizing and supporting with the Native American Church and the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative. Also, uh, announcing an open letter by the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative uh, Communications Committee, a call for the psychedelic community to respect and listen to Native American leadership and learn to trust a bit their rhythms and their own pace as moving forward, asking some kind of patience regarding uh, how they are planning to extend cultivation actions and this, some of these questions will be addressed in, in, in this webinar. So the webinar is on May 25th. Uh, if we can get this hundred people over there too, 
uh, it's really important that um, we pay attention to what the native people, peyote is the main sacrament of this land of the United States where I stand and native people uh, here have probably the lowest uh, rights and <laughs> voice in from all minorities have been really stigmatized um, and are asking for our attention. So those are very important documents. Uh, I want to also move to Shayla and uh, I really want to just also say how much of a fan of your writing and as a kind of anthropologist and publisher and writer, I, I always admire people that write and, and make shit happen through their writing. So what's next for you in your writing projects and what is your dream or what do you want to see in terms of the future or how do we come back bad actors? What do you want to share for your final piece? Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, as a journalist, I think my number one goal is to, um, I'm going to say access again, but make information accessible, right? There's a lot going on in many different places. And I, so whenever I write an article, my goal is that somebody who's curious about this space and wants to know what's going on can go to one place and kind of get a lot of information at one time and um, have it be easy to understand and easy to read. Uh, and, you know, part of that is also presenting things really objectively, right? Like I, the, the ways that I'm an advocate for this is that, you know, I don't think this is controversial. Like I believe in fair access and I think um, that's, that's really my only goal. Um, I think that, you know, what I hope for for the future is something akin to pluralism, which is this idea that uh, there's not one right way that a person might interact with these substances, especially as we open them up to more people. And on that point, I just have to say something about randomized clinical trials, which is that um, I think one of the problems right now when we talk about psychedelics is there's so few legitimate access points that we're lumping together lots of different kinds of people when we talk about psychedelic use. Um, and then, and then there are disagreements about the best ways to say, is it safe? Is it not safe? Who should get it? How can you get it? Um, but really we're talking about people who will be accessing these in very different contexts. Um, so like Ali said, at retreats, those are really supposed to be for, right, quote, healthy, normal people. I think anybody would agree that it's not ethical for somebody who's had treatment resistant depression for years, suicidality for years, to go and be in a container that's not as supportive as possible. And so when we talk about randomized clinical trials, I think those are necessary in order to say to the most vulnerable people that we're trying our best to say that we think this is gonna work for them and that we think it's gonna be safe for them. And again, that's for a very specific population. And so I don't think that valuing RCTs means that people shouldn't be able to do their own personal growth work or that home grow isn't isn't allowed. I mean, Oregon is a great example of like, that's a decriminalization process and they're taking what, two years to talk about exactly how it is they're gonna deliver this. And it's not just for depressed people, it's for everybody. And the reason is it's because it's so complicated. And so I think that a pluralistic view and understanding that some people might need a different kind of container than others is what I really hope to see going forward. Um, because even within the community, I can see there's this temptation to say, you know, like psychiatry is not the best vessel for this. And I think that's true for lots of people, but I think for lots of people, they do need that that container and they do need the two therapists in the room for them and more importantly they might want that so with mental health autonomy is one of the biggest things that's a problem people with mental health issues are constantly being told you have to go on this there are no other options you know like being forced to take medication and i think autonomy giving the people the choice and multiple avenues with which to explore even the same substance is is what i would like to see in the future great uh and again with the wonderful accent from Motherhouse uh, UK, let's close this out, bring us out. Alexander, also known as Ali Biner, what are your final wisdom thoughts for us, my friend? Thank you. I'm just trying to picture Motherhouse UK as a as a town. So it's a strange town. So yeah. Um, <laughs> so, it is a thing for Americans, the UK. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm actually half Irish and half German, so that, that's the, that's this accent. But um, yeah, I yeah definitely want to echo um, what what everyone else has, has said already. I think um, I'm really uh, feeling inspired actually just by this panel because what I would like is and and what my hope is is um, a really vibrant 
mature, uh, nuanced psychedelic culture that can hold complexity. And my, I guess like the way I sort of like uh, grew up in some sense uh, and the, the places, I, the internet forums I was on when I was like from, from 18 onwards were really kind of what shaped me and they were psychedelic forums, you know, full of, you know, conversations about philosophy and conversations about um, psychology and, and, and everything in between. And it felt like there was a, a real sense of um, connectedness in that. And I think that's still there. I just think w the community has become so much bigger, especially over the last couple of years, that there's a natural kind of dis a kind of displacing of kind of core values. And that it's and and I think the core I think part of this process that we're going through and part of the reason that um, you know a big shout out to the psychedelic society has been kind of carrying that torch in a lot of ways. Um, a big part of that is um, just defining what our values are as as a community, which is kind of the kind of thing we're in the process of doing now, and then understanding the power of culture. Uh, you know, there's a famous phrase that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so we can strategize about how to combat bad actors um, and we can strategize, which we should, and we can strategize about different methods of access, um, how to balance uh, clinics and retreats, et cetera. And that's all really important. And I think we, we do need to be strategizing about, strategizing about different patent approaches. But if we don't have a strong culture which is rooted in something real and authentic and deeply connected, then all those strategies are gonna, gonna fall out the window. So my, my hope is that we can keep building and, and holding the torch of what it means to be psychedelically inclined, you know, what it means to be someone who values the, the philosophy and the approach of these medicines. Like, you know, even this, and, and it, I think it, I think it filters into everything. It filters into the way we look at mental health because instead of trying to numb everything out, we're saying, hey, these medicines teach you to look at your pain and they teach you to go in and through and they teach you that not to resist. And, and that, that, that when, when you resist and when you try and block things out, that's when, you, that's when things get worse. And so the whole philosophy of how psychedelics heal is also something I, can, like, I think can heal culture as a whole. So that's, that's kind of my hope that the the message from the from the medicines and the experience starts to filter into the our wider society like it's kind of a lofty hope i actually think we start to become a much more psychedelic culture over time and that's going to require a very strong foundation um and that that foundation goes into so many different areas it goes into how we look at religious use how we look at patenting how we how creative we are how imaginative we are so and that's that's up to all of us, like every single person on this call right now, all of us here on the panel, thousands of people all around the world. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my hope that we get a bit of a psychedelic fire going. Thank you so much. I, I also want to give my very short one, one, two cents to this. I think we definitely should, you know, work a balance of when important calling out something, being really careful to really pick well the battles. And you know, one needed. Eventually, we do have to stand up and say things uh, on the one side. Uh, but on the other side, what we got to do is really lead by example, and that's what we're trying to do in Chakruna, and that's what I, you know, try to do in all the projects. Like, you have time to criticize things. Yes, it's legitimate when important, but also it's very hard to build things. <laughs> so to offer alternatives and concrete solutions and build pathways forward. I think it's also you know, a big homework for all of us. And Ali and I uh, have, have shared uh, concerns of you know, being picked by same kind of haters and uh, you know, uh, having challenges <laughs> to navigate our public persona and, and nonprofits. And our pact and our, our agreement is let's just uh, rock it and crush it and just lead by making, as David Bronner would say, awesomeness by bam, by just like creating more and more good content, good conversations, mind blowing, sexy, catchy, uh, expanding activities, readings and encounters and meetings. 
And in that, I want to put the two cents of the grassroots organizations that, you know, you're not going to need to lobby for an anthropologist that culture is important. Hey, we already know that. We chose that for a profession. But yeah, we have to create a culture that, uh, that stimulates access, inclusion, diversity, reciprocity, queer people, peer people from the global south, uh, people of color, indigenous people, people that are experts on culture and working on cultural paradigms is as important, as fundamental, as central as working on healing people and bodies, because we need to, to create, recreate cultural narratives about who we are as a community, as a society, as a movement. And creating these conversations is as equally as important as creating the treatments themselves. Uh, so I'm saying this because it's very hard for grassroots organizations like us, like Rebel Wisdom, like the UK Psychedelic Society, sometimes to get funding for projects that are diffuse, that you can't really measure the impact. Uh, but if we don't work on the roots of the drug, of the drug war, on, on, on uh, the roots of the stigma, of this culture of fear, of this culture of persecution, of this uh, myths and lies that we were told, uh, you know, about what our sacraments are on the one side. And if you don't create counter narratives for, you know, this idea that it's always been like this and it has to continue to be like this and it won't survive if it's not like this, if we don't create that other roots, then we're going to be stuck on this. So I think we need more events like this. Again, shout out for um, Aina and her team for bringing together what I think is a very uh, unique uh, conversation and pioneering in this regard. We are going to move for questions and answers. Also want to make a plug for our event, a, a community call, a call for community reflection on psychedelics, healing and race, which is Friday um, that we're promoting in Chikruna. And now I'm going to start, want to tell everybody that, sorry that we can't take all the questions and this, the chat will be saved. The panel will be filmed. Uh, and now we have a bunch of questions. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to ask help here from some native speaker, maybe Shayla. So we like women and we do acknowledge having, you know, lack of person of color in this panel, which is always, uh, you know, a limiting factor. And we should uh, uh, work on more. But maybe Shayla, do you think you could help me? and read the questions because your English is so much better than mine. <laughs> it's my task, but I'm, uh, you know, it's a lot to be on camera and say things. Uh, can you help me and read the sure, first question? Sure, sure, but which, which questions should yeah, I read? You just, let's go by the first one by John Anderson and maybe, okay. yeah, I'll guide from there. Um, this looks like a question for Ali, our UK representative. So it's, do the panelists think the best place to house psychedelic assisted therapy in the UK at least would be within counseling and psychotherapy as part of a larger movement in relation to expanded states of consciousness? If we did this and counselors could use it with clients, access might be easier for various spiritual practices. I can't see how this would possibly be the case within the standard medical model, which doesn't get spirituality. Um. Yeah, it's an interesting question. The, you know, I'm not an expert on the ins and outs of regulation in the UK, um, even though even though I live here. But I think the the general point is, it it's a tricky one because we we need to really clearly define in some way what is religious use and what is um, uh, use for personal growth. Are those two things different? And is a counselor or a psychotherapist qualified to hold a group, for example, necessarily just because they're a counselor or psychotherapist? Do they need different training to hold a group of, say, 10 people going through an experience? And likewise, um, how do we create a system that's fair for, for someone, you know, like a Santo Daime or, you know, other religious groups who are using medicines in a religious setting and have been for a long time so they don't get shut out if it becomes a, a question of, it's psychotherapists and counselors. Um, in the UK, I think psychotherapy is a protected um, title. Uh, counseling isn't, as far as I know. So there's a there's a kind of um, slight regulatory thing going on there. Um, the 
yeah, my my own preference would be that there is something like the Oregon model, which I think has been mentioned a few times. That I definitely want to give another shout out to because um, I really, you know, I, I interviewed Tom Eckhart just a couple of days ago. Um, I've just been very impressed with what he and Sherry and everyone in Oregon achieve. I think that a model that's very intelligently thought out and has gone through, like I think, uh, Shelley, you might have mentioned a two year process of figuring out from getting the law in place to how do we actually decide how this gets implemented? I think that's very, very smart. And one of the things that they've put into that is that you don't have to be previously credentialed in order to be holding space for people. So you don't have to be a certain type of therapist. That of course raises its own questions because we also have to be real about the fact that there's a huge amount of abuse uh, in the underground uh, that's not regulated. The benefit of the medical system is that it's regulated and you have a system of checks and balances. And I think that's very, very important. There's a huge amount of vulnerability in the psychedelic space. There's a huge amount, as David mentioned earlier, ego inflation. I've seen it happen many times. People get, even non-psychedelic people leading leading groups and retreats have to really look at transference and really keep their egos in check. It's a really dangerous combination to just let anyone hold psychedelic space. So short answer is I don't know, but I think it'll, it would require uh, a lot of thought um, and a lot of, uh, yeah, maturity, I think. And if I can just add on the point of spirituality, I just put a link in the chat of an article that I wrote, which is about this, this truth, which is that a lot of times when people have a psychedelic experience, um, even if they're not, don't have a pre-existing spirituality, religious or metaphysical beliefs, those things come up. And so it, it, it's not something that that means that it can never be in the realm of psychology, but people who are trained to hold space for those having psychedelic experiences, whether they have a psychology background, whether they're therapists or whether they're not, everybody needs to be prepared for that and to engage in some ethical meaning making because I don't think it's ethical to put your spiritual beliefs onto other people, but to let them come to their own conclusions. And that's what that piece is about. This is something that modern medicine hasn't really had to deal with yet. And it doesn't mean that they can't deal with it, but we have to be extremely aware of it and cognizant of it as, as we move forward. Um, and yeah, I think that what Oregon is doing shows how, how careful and how attuned they are to all of these things. And I think it's I think it's wonderful that they're opening it up to anybody. I think a big part of that also is that uh, you just need to have a high school degree in order to do it. So we're not, you know, gatekeeping this in any way possible, but there will be, um, you know, a lot of thought put into who exactly gets to hold space in this way. And I think that's the important piece of it, not exactly like exactly what credentials people should have, because there could, you know, there, there are bad actors with all kinds of degrees. And so we, we just need to come up with other ways to figure out who are the best people to do this. Right on, and, and I just want to jump in, and you know, I'd already had a note down uh, to Ali's uh, earlier comment um, about uh, you know, ideally, society we have like uh, you know, religious circles and ceremonial circles are competent in pre-screening individuals, you know, at, at least to some level, and I can I can diagnose okay, this person's really dealing with a level of trauma here that's not really appropriate to invite them in the circle yet. They should work individually. Uh, you know, just kind of, you know, to do some healing work um, and you'll be able to refer them. And in the, the organ model, you know, what's important um, in, in addition to allowing uh, and not gatekeeping, uh, you know, requiring a credential, which I think is huge. I think, you know, oftentimes like the pool of competent psychiatrists relative to the underground, you know, for holding space. I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a joke, but, you know, to make the case that, you know, MDs are somehow uniquely more qualified to, to hold this space than people who have underground experience and, and really understand and navigate. Um, but nonetheless, that there, there is recognition that when you're dealing with severely traumatized people or you know, severe PTSD or treatment resistant depression, that it is a good idea to have somebody who is more trained in, in dealing with, with trauma processing or you know, depressive, you know, severe depression and I think, you know, and how Tom and, and Cherie really are, are, are approaching this, and, and Cherie tragically passed, um, unfortunately, in, in, in December, but lived to see her dream come true, but that there will be kind of a tiered approach to credentialing. Like generally for most people, you don't need to have a credential guide, but if you are really, um, you know, suffering a severe, you know, mental condition that, 
there'll be a, how do you say, appropriateness of fit. So there's going to be some kind of mechanism, like there'll be like a, a screening, like a common screening questionnaire, a common core curricula that all guys are trained in. But then if you are presenting like a severe PTSD or, or, or treatment resistant depression, that you would then be referred by, you know, whoever does the initial screening, if they don't have, you know, don't have the competency that they would then refer you to who does in, in just having this ecosystem, as Ali eloquently said, you know, that is all reinforcing each other and talking to each other and sharing best practices and learnings and of adverse events as well. And we're just constantly elevating, you know, just across the board. Should I read the next question? Yes, please. Uh, the way it's always been done really works well for investors. And since the money seems to determine that whether and how something is done, it's going to take some powerful advocacy to break that spell, restoring the money to the role of service rather than us being in service to it. Are there powerful investor voices committed to relinquishing the way that serves them and agitating for it? Maybe we should give that one to David. I, the real, <laughs> the only probably <laughs> business person with some ideas <laughs> about- Yeah, that. definitely. And, and um, I can throw in a link, me, me and our, our director of constructive capital, Lesavo, just wrote a, 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 a blog basically about impact investing and, and, and really about impact first investing. Like a lot of impact investing is a little bit of a joke, but um, you know, it's, it's still pretty geared towards return. And it's just kind of like, um, how do you say, and doing some like kind of superficial screens that like not invest in like the worst of the worst, but isn't necessarily really focused on impact. But there are, there are uh, very impact first uh, motivated investors in the space that are deploying capital in a way that, um, you know, like on the spectrum, you've kind of got philanthropy, you know, grant making, which is, you know, there's no, no, no ownership, no return. Um, and then you've got impact loans where you're not interested in taking an ownership position and you're not interested in maximizing return and you're accepting a low interest payment. And those can be structured uh, in a way that are, how do you say, uh, depend within the beneficiary organization's internal rate of return. So they're not obligated if they can't pay it, you know, it's, it's kind of tied to their ability. Um, and, um, you know, and then there's, you know, there's a whole spectrum all the way to like profit maximizing equity positions, which the question questioners, you know, concern is, and, you know, obviously those kind of investors are, are problematic and being really careful about who we take money from is key. Um, but that there is, you know, you know, not just us, but, you know, there's this psychedelic science funders collaborative and there are a lot of philanthropists uh, looking to deploy capital in, in a good way. Um, I mean, and it, it is a spectrum, but I think there is more than enough capital out there to fund these business models that are being set up ethically, multi-stakeholder business models. And um, yeah, so it's just about, um, uh, you know, identifying these, these investors and, and philanthropists and, and then models like Journey Collab and Mimosa and Usona and Maps and, and others can really, you know, get the, the, how do you say, capitalization they need, but not in a way that uh, sabotages their mission, um, which is I, all I was, the story. Yeah. Thank you. I, Chakruna was a beneficiary of uh, this construct, I think from Les related to, to David, uh, boot camp for grassroots nonprofits. So they chose, I think, 15 organizations to teach them how to fundraise and um, learn how to pitch things for investors. And I learned uh, about, do, do you mind sharing, David, how much, how much you guys shared in philanthropy last year? Well, COVID was really good for the soap business. So we were able to, uh, and our model is to just give everything we don't need to the causes and charities of support. And that, you know, obviously Oregon's campaign was a key beneficiary, but we gave away about 15 million last year. We usually give half that, you know, or, um, but, uh, but last year was unique, although, you know, this year it won't be as big as, as last year, but, uh, you know, hopefully something like nine. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we're, we're really optimistic to see, you know, that's, that equates to about 45% of our pre-contribution profit. Um, you know, the rest we need for the, for the business itself. Um, 
and it equates to about 7.5% of our net rev. But we're we're really optimistic to see you know like maps become a, a, another example of really being able to, to adopt a pricing cost structure strategy where all the profit that you don't need strictly for the organization instead of going to shareholders goes to the movement you know the beneficiary is the movement and the ideals that the movement stands for um and you saw well, i think that uh you know that remarks that that merits a little thank you note <laughs> the 15 million dollars donated in uh 2020 for the psychedelic movement so yeah i think well, it, it didn't all go to the psychedelic movement but like yeah to six to million into the, yeah yeah so anyway i think I think this movement is appreciative of that. I am appreciative of that. <laughs> I think it merits a thank you, to say the least. And uh, Shayla, can you read the next one? Sure, just keep going down the list. Yes. Uh, Phil asks, when the current system collapses, which it most likely will given the rise of AI and the inevitable rise of the useless class, is there much need for us to worry about any of this given there'll be no money to be made? Who wants to answer Phil? Any candidates? Uh, well, I'll just say that I think it's worth worrying about because what else? I think that's better than, than, than not. So, you know, we've, we've talked about people that are are good actors and that we are looking to for good examples. And I think for me, um, anybody who's actively talking about this and taking steps now um, is somebody who's just trying to fight for the best future possible. So, you know, and, and I also think that, um, you know, when we talk about a company not putting profit and growth as their first priority. Um, there's lots that we can learn from other social movements that do involve kind of the thing that you're talking about, which is sort of like uh, the, the disconnect between how much we work and the automation of labor. For example, I'm thinking about the degrowth movement, which is a climate change movement that seeks to intentionally decrease um, industries that, reduce, that emit carbon into the air and advocate for better social systems and so everybody would work like three or four days and we take advantage of this automation of labor but in ways that really help people and help the environment so i think that there are ways to think about um you know this the coming collapse of society in a social justice sense and thinking about how we can fight for people to come out of that uh, in a good way and not and not a bad way i would just add briefly um we cover quite often uh on on rebel wisdom um you know, thinkers in the space of existential risk uh, who are looking at, uh, you know, questions like this, questions like systems collapse, um, the rise of AI, et cetera. And my own perspective on it is that um, there are so many unknown unknowns uh, in the future of how things might pan out that it's not, I don't find it particularly useful to, um, stop acting now with the assumption that things are going to be kind of uh, some way in the future. I think most of the the people I've noticed who who spend all day advising government and um, thinking about questions like this are actually some of the most active people in, in trying to put systems in place now um, that are sustainable. So I think, um, sure, could could be a could be a scenario. Um, but I think if the one of the moves is to uh, double down on effort and to try and create um, uh, an anti-fragile system that that's going to be uh, robust enough when the old system fails. So that's that's one way to look at it, which I find a bit, uh, yeah, productive or useful. Graham, you're too quiet. Any comments on the last rounds? Uh, um... Not on the last one, but maybe I can grab one of the ones coming up. It's lunchtime here in San Francisco. Okay, let's go <laughs> to the next one. Shayla? Uh, the next question is for you. Um, please share your critical analysis and your personal feelings about the current attempts by corporations and universities to patent a synthetic pill that is modeled ayahuasca, commonly nicknamed pharmawasca. Hey, Mudge, um, nice to see you. Uh, for those people that uh, don't know, Mudge has been uh, doing a research about the potentials of ayahuasca in treating bipolar disorders. 
have a little controversial topic that a lot of people feel strongly that uh, people with bipolar conditions shouldn't be using psychedelics. Uh, yeah, that's a really dense question. Um, I don't know if you're talking about sacred medicines, which is this new business, uh, public corporation business by Victoria Halley and Leanna Standish that is emerging on the US because they are not using pharma wasca. They are trying to use um, the, 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 the plant itself. Or if you're talking about uh, attempts in Switzerland by Milan and his team to to create pharma wasca. So I'm, I'm not really clear which, you know, each project uh, has a specific, maybe you can post there on the chat if you're still there, which one you're talking about. Each project has a, a different um, aspect. I don't think, you know, there's a simple question. I would just, uh, like to make a distinction between Bielabachi ayahuasca drinker and Bielabachi intellectual and executive director. And, you know, as a person that have, have my spiritual path, I couldn't care less to go drink ayahuasca in a, in a lab <laughs> with a bunch of doctors and trying to measure me. So that's not the kind of place that I want to hang out in. You know, I like to go to the Amazon and I lived in Mexico and I'm kind of a plant person. Uh, and I am enthusiastic of uh, culture and tradition and indigenous people and shamanism, ritual and ceremony. But as, as, as a public personality and, you know, an author and writer, uh, our stance in the Chikrina Institute is to help facilitate the conversation. I think sometimes people want easy answers and there's not so many easy answers. And we're building a lot of the answers. So it might, it might look like I'm not giving an answer, <laughs> but my answer is that we need to build this together collectively uh, as, as a group, as a community. So a lot of our conferences have, have done this attempt and we try to invite from you know, the rich uh, business person to the philanthropist, to the indigenous person, to the grassroots organization, to the academic, to the uh, researcher and and try to sit and build these things collectively because I think in terms of drug policy, that's what frequently is missing, is having a conversation and, and coming to uh, giving different seats on the table for people to talk. It's a very basic idea, but it's very rare when you do drug policy things uh, to consult the users. It's kind of an exotic thing to call users to talk about how they feel. So for example, now, uh, we have held in our conference, there was a very hot uh, conversation about this perspective of um, this, this project to make uh, bring ayahuasca to the FDA. So for the people that are involved, they think they're doing something very progressive because they're trying to work with the plant. And there's only two botanical preparations that were approved by the FDA. So for them, it's a whole attempt to do things in a more progressive way. They also want to work with shamanic practitioners, which they believe is, is kind of progressive because you're taking into account other kinds of knowledge. And they're also creating a MAPS PBC, which is a mixed model that has doesn't have profit at the forefront, but rather wants to use part of the profit to reinvest. But on the other side of the spectrum, you had indigenous folks saying, you know, that that's, uh, feels really bad for them and feels like cultural appropriation. And, and extractivism and colonialism, and they can't see any benefits to that. Uh, and there is nothing in that for them and that they don't feel that, you know, they need science to prove that that is already uh, what they know works. They don't need a scientist to go collect, uh, you know, I'm gonna do a EEG on, on, on your brain to show that ayahuasca works for indigenous person, for a shaman, that is not really relevant. It's not an epistemological, ontological question for that person. And it's not gonna change her life on the short term. And then, you know, for them, the people that are involved in this, they think that this is a way to reschedule ayahuasca and help benefit everybody. And then there's the question, are we interested in rescheduling and benefiting everybody? So it's very complex. I think in the terms, I'll just jump to, to the question of Eduardo that I see next. The indigenous discussion is complicated also because it's very much against 
uh, indigenous principles, this idea of ownership, one person owning, you know, the whole patent model is very Western. Think about, for example, of indigenous paintings, you no? Know? Think about the Kene patterns that are those patterns of a lot of Pano using groups. They say, so a, a, a Western artist, he will go and replicate that and copy that art. But he would never do that art with the art of a sign of a, of a Western sci, uh, uh, painter or artist because you just don't copy the artist, the art from an artist. <laughs> but you do that with indigenous people sometimes. Why? Because sometimes people have a hard time understanding that uh, you know uh, this doesn't belong just to one person. It belongs to a culture. So it doesn't belong just to one individual in the culture, it belongs to the culture in general. And when it comes to sacred plants, it's even more complicated because there are several indigenous groups that claim rights over certain species. So if you were to give back, to who would you give back? For example, ayahuasca, uh, would you give back to which groups? There are more than 70 that use ayahuasca. If you're talking about peyote, just federally recognized, non-federally, mestizo, there's lots of users. It's It's complicated to, define which is the only person. So it doesn't mean that we don't have to discuss that. And it doesn't mean that they don't have rights. <laughs> it just complex, complexifies it a bit. But I think your both questions are excellent. I want to take up the challenge. And Anya, in, in the invisible world, let's take up this challenge, David. Let's uh, you know create a next round talking about IP and in indigenous rights, because I do think that's really important. And these discussions are, are here for us to create and for us to have. And so I think those are really good questions. And this brings me to the end. Um, and I see the happy face of my dear friend. Also wanna tell everybody that Anya is directing a movie, a documentary about the psychedelic Renaissance and she's an all women crew and she's looking for funding and she wants to fundraise $50,000 and she was a bit dismayed because us warriors on the path sometimes get dismayed. And I told her, let's let's rock and crush it. And Chakruna is organizing an event July 14th to help her fundraise $50,000 that she needs uh, for her documentary. And these are, you know, the wonders of COVID created wonderful new friendships. <laughs> the paradoxes of living isolated strengthen global ties, virtual friendships across the pond, across the globe. So my gratitude to your friendship, Anya, and your leadership. And with that, I give the word back to you. Thank you, Bia. And also I must say, I'm super excited and happy for this um, international friendship and our ties between US and UK getting closer and we can really cooperate and try to tackle all those issues and problems together. It feels like community is really getting tighter. Uh, so thank you, Bia, and thanks for your great moderation as always. I'm so glad I didn't take to all moderate this panel myself because I would fail big time. So thank you, Bia, you're just the best moderator in the world. And just to thank David and Graham and Shayla and Alexander for sharing your knowledge and your energy and time. You're like my dream speakers to have and you all agreed. So thanks so much for just spending those two super intense two hours with us. And last thing, thanks to the audience. That was the best chat we ever had at, a, at an event, I must say, the most lively, engaged chat. So thanks to everyone in the audience. And I see a lot of friends and known names. So thanks for your support um ongoing support for the society yeah great event i enjoyed uh, every minute of it and therefore this is the end uh, i don't know if anybody has any final thoughts to share well i suppose then i'll let you go and enjoy because it's really late and some of you have dogs to go out with and <laughs> and dinners to maybe eat not dinners too late for dinner okay Enjoy your evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Bye. Yeah.